MCC TV is largely about what happens in the classrooms of Metropolitan Community College, and we also present interviews with speakers, authors, and performers who visit our campuses. And once a quarter, we sit down with the president and the CEO of the Greater Omaha Chamber of Commerce for a chat about the economic health and development of our viewing area. The conversation ahead is about the year in review 2020 and how we've fared so far through the COVID pandemic. I'm Kent Pavelka, your host, and David Brown joins me next on MCC TV. Well, David, it's been three months since we've had this chat. Uh, can't start anywhere else except to ask you your analysis of how we have all navigated through the pandemic, through the entirety of it, really, and then specifically uh, over the last three months or so. Well, morning, Kent. Good to see you again. Happy New Year, although I know it's uh, a month and a half, almost two months uh, since uh, we hit 2021. With that collective sigh of relief that 2020 was finally behind us. Um, you know, I think in retrospect, if you look at where Omaha ended up and where the region ended up, economically, you could look at the number in January of 2020 and then look at the numbers uh, for unemployment uh, in 2021, and they're remarkably similar. Um, now, there's an awful lot of detail behind the numbers that, that tell a little bit of a different story. Um, I think the, the challenge, of course, that we all faced was that there was huge unemployment happened in the really the beginning of the second quarter of 2020. Uh, and that was reflected by you know, 60,000 people for, uh, filing for unemployment. Um, we're, so we don't have the same number of people working today as we did a year ago. That number is still about seven or eight thousand less um, the today working than there was a year ago working, and part of that is due to uh, labor force has shrunk a bit, which means people have probably stopped um, seeking uh, employment right now if they're um, have unemployment benefits. Um, but we're slowly but surely seeing an increase. So think about that: sixty thousand people in April down to about um, 15,000 or so people now that are unemployed in the community. Um, that's a significant growth in jobs. Um, and I think our economy um, really stood the test really very, very well. I think it, it showed the importance of our essential businesses that are here, uh, the, the, the number of them, the size of them, their capacity to very quickly pivot from a, an in-person sort of environment to as much remote environments as they could. And I think honestly, the ability over the last several months uh, to do that safely. So we didn't see huge spreader events um, in May, June, July, August, September, all through the end of the year that were employee driven, employer driven. Uh, we ended up with um, still being rated as one of the top communities in the country when it came to our economy coming back. Uh, in September, uh, there was an indication from a national study that showed that Omaha had the highest percentages of its small businesses had come back to business as compared to January. Um, that was about a 13 and a half to 15 and a half percent of our small businesses were still not open, but that was one of the best numbers in the country. There's another study we've looked at recently that shows um, the number of small businesses that remain open compared against 60 top metro areas and the national number. Um, and shows that Omaha is, is continually in the top 10% of those communities, um, easily beating the national number of, of the number of transactions that continue. So if you think about transactions, right? If your business is closed, there's no financial transactions. So they attract transactions across a whole bunch of different um, environments and show that Omaha continues to be far more resilient than a lot of other places. So I think the good news overall is that the economy, uh, while not back to pre-COVID levels, um, did well. And in relative terms, we did very well. Uh, I would suggest though that there are still um, more people out there that are needing jobs that are unemployed um, than we would like. Because if, if only 13% of our small businesses um, are closed compared to January of 2020, that's still 3,200 businesses. 
So you think about the average number of people that work for those businesses, and let's just say that it's three or four people, because most of our, our businesses in this market uh, remain small businesses. To, you know, 15,000 people um, that are unemployed, that need to get to a point where they have a job again. And the employer that they had before uh, the COVID environment might not even be around any longer. So we've got that, that level that we still got work to do. But in, in the large picture, boy, our economy did well, our community did well, and um, economic development continued. And I think uh, you know, the community responded very well to really this triple pandemic of COVID-19, uh, social justice issues, and the economic recession that hit it as a result of those two items. Well, let's talk about both ends of that, uh, the points you make. 3,200 businesses still teetering, if you will. Mm -hmm. What are the prospects for them and their employees as you see it? And then why do you think that we did so well, re our resilience was so good comparatively? Well, let's, let's deal with the first one. I think um, most of those businesses that remain um, closed or closed during, uh, since January of 2020 were in the um, food and entertainment industry. So restaurants, bars, um, event spaces. I mean, there, there were some retailers, et cetera, that closed and some of them were national in, in nature. So we, we all saw, um, I'll call them the big box stores that closed their doors nationally as a result of this shift from people walking into their physical presence to the online stores that, that, that hit. So I think what, what I've seen here is that we've got companies that um, may not come back because they've been closed for so long. It, it, they didn't have any cash flow. They had just sort of hung up the, the towel and said, we're not going to go back and do it again. But at the same time, we're seeing people stepping in behind them and uh, creating new opportunities. So I think over the next year, over 2021 and even into 2022, we're going to see as much backfilling as we, as we could expect for people to come back and say, well, there's a great facility there that basically is ready to operate and I can come in with my new concept and start afresh. And so I think we're going to see a lot of startups happening um, in this, this next market. And, you know, not just the chamber, but city government, county government, state government, and the federal government are all providing resources to make it easier for small businesses to come back. And that's still the lifeblood of our economy. So I think you're going to see replacement of those businesses that closed. And you're going to see a continued move towards more and more online resources being necessary for retailers and food companies and basically all companies to be able to do, to do well. Um, I mean, why we did well, I think, you know, part of it is this, what we're doing right here today. Uh, Omaha has a, a robust and redundant uh, internet capacity um, as a result of Stratcom being here and our huge financial services uh, businesses being here. I mean, companies were able to pivot very, very quickly uh, to an online version and then stay there and prove that they could be productive. And so while nobody had a plan that says, tomorrow we're gonna go from 100% in the office to 100% remote, um, it seems like not only here, but in many places across the country, but particularly here, companies were able to make that shift and figure out a way to have their employees be productive uh, in an environment that was, was challenging. And then I guess finally, the other is that we're so diversified. Um, we saw interestingly, um, even with weather challenges that the ag industry, ag prices went up some. And so we saw agriculture uh, doing better than it had in, in prior years. Um, we continue to see growth in our financial services sector, uh, and we continue to see, uh, while, we, while we saw challenges in other parts of the market, we saw growth in, other, in, in additional parts of the market. So I think that diversity helped balance us pretty well out there. And we're going to, we always see that when there's a challenge economically, this diversity of our economy makes a huge difference. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the things that uh, were noteworthy in the fourth quarter and overall in 2020. Um, some real positive uh, developments uh, with Amazon, Dollar General, and again, you're going to have to help me with the pronunciation. Is it Vireo? Yes, yeah, Vireo Resources down in Cass County, sure. Yeah. So, you know, just because we had this only a pandemic and only, you know, significant social justice issues across the country and here in our market, um, 
the rest of, of the world didn't stop. And so once people got used to the notion that there was a, a way to function during this pandemic, um, many of our economic development projects just continued forward. And our economic development team figured out how to, to manage those projects in this very strange virtual environment that, that we are in. And we continued working with some of our economic development clients, three of them that we announced in the fourth quarter, including uh, Amazon's very large project um, in uh, Sarpy County, Dollar General in Washington County, and Vireo Resources in Cass County. You know, those three projects um, will generate about 3,500 jobs in the construction industry and about 2,000 additional jobs um, during, during construction with 2,000 new full-time long-term jobs that'll help support another 2,000 jobs in the community. So in that last quarter, we're able to land some pretty big projects. This, this, is, these are, this is an Amazon fulfillment center, which is you know, eight or 900,000 square feet of robotic automated center that'll still have hundreds and hundreds of jobs. Uh, same with Dollar General, will be a refrigerated uh, facility up in Washington County, the first one of its kind here. And, you know, Vireo is a really interesting company that continues to grow in Cass County. So it's nice to be able to see that we were able to continue growing uh, the, the market here during, um, during the last quarter. For the year, we still ended up with 46 landed projects. So think about that. In the middle of a pandemic and economic recession, we still landed 46 projects, totaling just shy of $500 million in projected capital investment. And overall, about 3,690 jobs. And then the payroll from that annually will generate about $79 million a year in annual payroll, which just flows right through you know, the, the community. So it was a, a, a remarkable year um, in economic development, even though we are in challenging times. It sure was. Um, talk a little bit about the impact of your Thrive 2020 task force in, in, in the mix of all this. Sure. So, you know, during the, when the pandemic first hit, our members were really concerned about how do I respond to this? I mean, where do I get the health information that I need so I can make informed decisions? Um, what do I do about government regulation? How do I know what the current regulations are about what I need to have in place when I bring my businesses back to work, my employees back to work? How can I do that safely and protect both my customers and my employees? Um, and then how do I keep track of uh, the most recent alerts and changes that might come from the governor's office or the mayor's office as far as how many people I can have in my place of business. Can I be open? If they say I can be open, do I have to open if I don't think I can do it profitably? So we prepared a document called uh, the We Rise document, which has been a living document on our website where businesses could go and access the most recent UNMC uh, information about the, the disease. Um, we'll see curated information about government regulations and about um, government rules and regulations regarding when they can open. Once we got that done, we started thinking about how long is this pandemic going to be in place and what's in the way for Omaha to be accelerating out of this recession that was caused by the pandemic and how do we get back to business as quickly as possible. So we created a Thrive 2020 task force that looked at areas in economic development, small business, workforce development, uh, diversity and equity, entrepreneurship and public policy, and tried to find those things that needed to happen that could help us accelerate into uh, the, the next economy, if you will, following the recession. Not knowing what that looked like, but thinking, you know, Omaha might come out of this faster than others. And so how can we be prepared to take advantage of that? And so those committees met aggressively and came up with some recommendations for things that we needed to do. So in economic development, as an example, despite the fact that our projects were continuing to flow, our backlog was shrinking pretty materially. So we typically would see in a normal economic development market, 15 to 18 new clients would be added to our prospect list every month. And then out of that, we typically would land about 60 projects a year. Well, we, in June, we were down to single digits in the number of, of new clients that had come to the mix. And so um, a new marketing effort was recommended for the fourth quarter that would start building our backlog for 2021 and beyond. And the good news is that started working early. By September, uh, we were up in the mid-20s as far as the number of prospects that were being generated. And um, we think that we're, we're back up to a point where we think our backlog is healthy and we'll continue to build that. In small business, we were trying to work on supplier diversity. 
How do we get more of our businesses, uh, larger businesses, doing business with a, a, a larger pool of our small businesses here in the market, particularly those that are minority owned or women owned or veteran owned? How do we get them into the supply chain more aggressively so that our local companies, particularly the larger ones, aren't so impacted by national, international supply chain challenges that we all saw happen during, during the pandemic? On the workforce, we knew that we had a number of unemployed people that hadn't been unemployed for a long time. How do they get them back to work? So we work with the governor's office in particular at Metro Community College to come up with a, a scholarship program for thousands of people that they can actually get learn a new skill, new skill and get back to work by April and May this year when their new upskilling work is done. In diversity and equity, there are a whole host of issues that we wanted to pay attention to, uh, particularly as it related to the social justice issues that came up in May and June and July of last year. And there were several specific ideas that came out of that that we're implementing now, not the least of which was trying to get more and more businesses in the process of assessing their ability to be diverse employers and hire, hire with equity and then have an inclusive culture in their business. So we doubled the number of businesses that were going through, through that process. Capital acquisition was really important in entrepreneurship. And in public policy, we had that weird year in public policy, you may recall too, Kent, that the legislature went out of session in June timeframe, and they didn't come back into session until October. But we had some pretty significant bills that needed to get passed in the legislature. And so the public policy committee prioritized LB 1107, which passed a new incentive bill, which we've been talking about for years, mm -hmm. uh, passed a bill that invested in the UNMC's next project, which was a major investment that matches about a billion dollars in DOD money. Um, and then finally, uh, some property tax relief um, that we thought would be possible, needed across the whole state. So some pretty significant imp uh, implementation plans and we put them all into place. And I think in the end, um, it made us stronger and able to really start accelerating out of this recession, uh, which we're now implementing many of these projects. David, something that has gone under the radar a little bit, I think, for the general public and, and is so vital to our uh, greater Omaha area is the future of the U.S. Strategic uh, U.S. Space Command. And uh, the reason I say it's gone under the radar is I, I don't know that people understand that, that there's a bidding process uh, that's, that's going on right now as to the future of all that. Yep. Uh, and obviously, uh, so far, so good. We're a finalist. But uh, talk about that. That's that represents what, 10,000 jobs? Yeah. So actually, it's about 1400 new jobs would come with this command. Right now, the Air Force Base has about 10,000 people working there. Um, so, you know, part of the, the business of owning, if you will, an Air Force Base in your community is making sure that it stays healthy. We have really spent the last few years making sure that uh, from the impact of the floods in 2019, um, and uh, wear and tear on the airport runway uh, that the capital dollars were available to bring it back into the top notch, top notch condition. And so as we speak, all the airplanes that typically fly out of Offutt Air Force Base are flying out of Lincoln Airport as they tear up our runway and rebuild it. That'll be done in somewhere, somewhere hopefully shy of 18 months, but we've been working on that project for several years. And then with the floods that happened at the base in 19, uh, we also have about $2 billion worth of reconstruction, reconstruction happening at the base. And it'll be basically a brand new Air Force base when all of this, this construction is done. Uh, but in the midst of all that, you're also trying to make sure you keep the missions that you have and that you add new important missions to your, your panoply of, of missions so that you're ensured that the future is bright for the kind of missions that you're going to have. In the midst of the pandemic, uh, the US Air Force uh, came out and, and asked states to bid on locating a new U.S. Space Command headquarters at their base. This was last May. Um, we did that in conjunction with the state. Um, in August, we found out that we had made the first cut. And in Thanksgiving, at Thanksgiving time, we found that we were in the final six as uh, communities that would, could support the U.S. Space Command headquarters. And so from basically Thanksgiving Day, until December 22nd, we had to put together a, a proposal that would reflect our desire for, to keep the base, uh, to keep the head, to, to put the headquarters here for the Space Command um, and show what we would do to make that happen. 
and so were all the other communities. So there were two presentations that had to be done. December 14th was basically military to military where they were comparing notes and making sure that the information they had was accurate. And then the 22nd, we had a proposal that we had to put in front of uh, this, this site evaluation team in a virtual environment like this, where we had uh, Senator Fisher uh, led the delegation and was um, talking to us from DC. Um, the governor led the state um, function and he was actually in Montana at the time. And so we had him on the call from Montana. Uh, we had Tim Burke, who was our chairman of the board and very active with uh, supporting military and Mayor Rusty Hike uh, from the Bellevue City Council Chambers. Uh, we had uh, Commander Marks from Offutt Air Force Base on the call as well. Um, and we had Ted Carter, president of University of Nebraska System, speaking to us from Lincoln, and then speaking to five people from the site evaluation team who were spread across the country too. Only in this kind of an environment, the Zoom, if you will, environment, could we have done something like that. And the team killed it. I mean, they, I have never been involved in a presentation that went better and one that had, was so fraught with potential risk. But I think we put together a very, very competitive package. And, um, and then once the 22nd was done, we went, went through Christmas holidays, waiting to hear from the Air Force. And in uh, mid-January, uh, just before the inauguration, uh, the Department of Defense announced that their preferred site was Alabama and um, that there were several alternatives, Omaha being one of them. Um, we take umbrage with the decision. We think that they discounted some things here that they should not have and that they took into consideration some things in, in Alabama that were never on the priority list for anybody else to be considered. And so we in Colorado and New Mexico in particular, which are three of the states that were in competition, continue to rally our delegation to uh, review that decision and make sure that it was done on an objective basis and that they use data that was uh, replicable in other places. The Inspector General has announced that they're going to uh, review that decision-making process and they're going through that review right now. So uh, th this was always going to be a long process uh, where the final decision really isn't made until 2023 and then construction would happen through 2028. So it's a, it's a long process. So we stay engaged in the hope that um, Offit continues to be one of those prime locations. What people seem to forget is that the US Space Command was at Offit Air Force Base from 2002 to 2019. And only moved to, uh, in a, to a temporary headquarters in Colorado as a result of the, the DOD creating the US Space Command as a standalone joint command. And it only moved there because they had to come out from under STRATCOM, which is a major command here as well. So um, it's been here for the most part for the past two decades, and we think it should be here anyway. So we, we continue to work on it, but it's one of those things that if you were gonna choose a year to have something like that come up, probably wouldn't have been 2020. And it probably wouldn't have been the last you know 45 days of the year where you would be meeting every day at 7 a.m. with a team of you know, 25, 30 people that are working on this thing. But it worked, and I'm really proud of the team and the work we did to try and land it. Well, I, I guess I am guilty of confusing the, the Space Command with the base. Um, and mm -hmm. thanks for the reminder that the, 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 the Space Command had been here. Is this, a, is this all about politics at this point? Yeah, there's a lot of politics that comes into play. So everyone always says, whether you're the Air Force or Department of Defense or whomever, you know, we're going to take all the data and we're going to rank all that data very objectively. And then we're going to say, this is the location where it should be. Um, three times in the last uh, 10 years, the, this, the Space Command being one of them, Omaha has been a finalist for a major command of some sort. A global strike in 2008 and nine. Defense Finance Center, um, I think it was 2010 or 11, maybe 12, um, we went through the same process. And in both of the prior ones, Offutt Air Force Base was the, the highest point gainer in the process. We were number one as the location. And in both of those situations, the, the, the base, the mission went somewhere else as a result of political considerations. Yeah. So we were bound to bent that that wasn't going to happen this time. Um, and yet we think it did. In the end, um, I think uh, as our delegation fought tooth and nail for this. And I got to tell you how proud I am of the work that, that they did to make sure this was something that 
would work here. We, we pulled out all stops. Um, but in the end, politics still, we think, entered into the fray as to where this thing ended up. We haven't seen the final numbers yet, but some of the early indications we've heard sell us, number one, we were the, the, the number two location for, for this in the assessment. But some of the things that they marked us down on, we think they did not give us enough credit for. As a matter of fact, they didn't give us any credit for the fact that the Space Command was here for 17 years. Um, and they didn't give us really credit for the kind of services that are already in place here because you know, a STRATCOM is here. Um, and, and so we know that somewhere along the way, um, politics entered this and we wanna see if we can't figure out a way to make it a more object objective process. Sure. Um, in the minutes we have remaining, just some uh, general opinions about going forward here. Do you feel like our economy in the greater Omaha area has hit the bottom have we seen the worst of this and 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 specifically for those folks that you mentioned that are they're still needing to transition from one career to another mm -hmm. what what help is there out there and what suggestions might you have well you know i think in the end ken our economy continues to be resilient and i think we're going to continue to see um, growth assuming we don't find a fourth leg of this triple pandemic um something bizarre doesn't happen um, I think all, all of the pieces and parts are in place for us to continue their robust growth. Our interesting challenge right now continues to be talent. Um, even though there are folks that are still unemployed from uh, the pandemic, um, some of the careers that they had prior to pan pandemic don't necessarily translate to where we have gaps in our talent availability. And so while we continue to work on upskilling folks from one job type to another, um, we, will, we will continue to face challenges in um, the availability of workers in certain key areas. Uh, Metro actually is helping significantly. They are the, the place where the governor's stimulus money is being focused so that people can be trained and exist in new careers. About 3,000 of the unemployed as a result of COVID have received scholarships from state stimulus money. Um, that is that they're going through right now in order to make sure they can get upskilled into jobs of the future. Um, but that's just the beginning. We need to do a, a much better job of filling that pipeline of for tech workers, for blue collar workers, particularly in skilled spaces. Um, and that's the work that really is ahead of us right now. We want to make a huge difference in long term resilience of our community. We need to keep growing the economy. We need to keep growing the population here. We need to retain as many workers as we can. And we need to get them on career paths that fulfill the demands of businesses that are here in the future. And I think we're on our path to do that. Uh, momentum is obviously uh, always important, maybe particularly so at this point in history, things are going pretty well, as well as maybe you could expect. Uh, so what do you what do you think is vital here in the next weeks and months? Well, you know, the legislature is going to continue doing what it can to, to make this a, a competitive place over the next two years, this year and next, you know, there's a large bit of work that uh, Nebraska Blueprint is doing uh, to lead the effort on comprehensive tax reform. I think that'll have as much impact on our ability to keep businesses here and keep empl employers and employees here and to attract talent as anything. We need to be more competitive. If you think about where all that, um, the migration of population from the large cities in the coast went to, they went to towns our size, but they also went to towns our size that happened to be in states that had low, low taxes, where they could actually not only move out of the big cities and all the challenges goes along with it, but they could do so and save a remarkable amount of money um, by having lower taxes. And I think, well, I know this is the chamber guy saying we, got, we need low taxes again, uh, but in the end, taxes are both a talent attractor or detractor and a company attractor or detractor. And we need to be more competitive in our tax structure if we want to be able to say people are going to move here to enjoy this great quality of life that we have and enjoy all the jobs that we have available, um, but they're going to come here because they know it's also affordable in comparison with other places. David, thanks for your time. Always enjoy it. Thanks, Ken. Take care of yourself. Be safe out there. And thank you for being with us on MCC TV. Our goal is to better acquaint you with the mission, the leadership, and the reach of the college. I'm Kent Pavelka with David Brown for Metropolitan Community College. Thank you.